I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I hope that we can do something useful. It's really difficult to solve our stress. You can't quick fix stress in in one half hour, or one hour, because you know, I, I my class at school is a semester long, and then I teach another one called Mind Body Wellness, it's kind of an advanced one that is more of the same. So how we fix this in this much time is tricky, but I'm gonna give I want to want you to come away with one thing today that I think is really useful, really, really powerful. And I want to start with a question because I'd like this to be very interactive versus me just talking. That's boring. But if, if I can have ask you some questions, first of all, how do you how do you guys know that stress is a thing for you, it's an issue for you in the first place? How does, because like, we were just talking about stress, no big deal, right? But it's the, it's the problems that are associated with stress that we don't like so much. So what might that include for you guys? High blood pressure? Yeah, you know, sometimes I know like my heart racing, I'm not sleeping well, I'm not eating how I used to or at all. So you eat less or more? Eat less. Eat less. <laughs> when you are stressed? Correct. Okay, and you feel your heart rate going faster? Correct. You can tell that. Okay. And what was the other thing? Oh, sleeping? And then I sleep a lot later. Okay, that all. So difficulty falling asleep? Okay. And then, Good. Not good that you have those. <laughs> 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 good example. Okay, what else? Oh, difficulty losing weight because of stress is related to your adrenals. Helps you hold on to weight? Yeah. And mm -hmm. you, you, when you work out, you're just not even more stressed. Stress. Which makes you want to hold on to it a little more. No, it makes you want to get rid of it, but it won't let me. Right. <laughs> Your body wants to hold on to it, you want to get rid of it. But the body says, I don't want to get rid of this. Now, there's a reason yeah. for that that's really interesting that we may get into in a second. Um, but good example. Any others that you notice? For me, I get migraines and I get pain in my neck. You can feel it like when, you're, when you're noticing. And your jaw, too, as you said? Like I really? Does, does it, it hurt? Huh? <clears throat> what, what, what do you do? I get snappy. My face breaks out. I get the pain right here too. But also, I sleep more and I eat more. <laughs> so so who, I, which one is the weird one? The one who eats less or the one who eats more? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, both are right. I mean, not right, but they're they're. There's a reason why some people eat less and some people eat more. And we'll, if we have time, we'll get into why that is. Um, anything else that you can think of? Um, David Taylor, uh, anxiety, a feeling of the world crushing you despite the fact that it's not. And, I, and I'd add to that um, how it affects your relationships. You're more prone to lash out or, you know, depending on your person. Right. More prone to right. yourself. <laughs> Good. What else? I was going to say, yeah, because of irritability and frustration. You just, like the relationship thing, you just want to be angry at everybody. But that, that you wouldn't normally be angry at, right? Right. So. <laughs> should I be aware of that? Yes. Yeah. So. Is there anything natural about a headache? You said you have a headache. Is there anything natural? Is that something that we should naturally have from time to time? Or not eating, or eating too much, or holding on to our weight? Is there anything natural about those things? In other words, are we designed to have a headache from time to time as a natural part of being? You think? Yeah, I can find Could be. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but as far as, like, or ir being irritable, is that a natural thing for us to be angry at people? No. <laughs> it does, sort of. I think it's a natural thing. So, here's, I, I want to toss this out to you guys, and 
it may feel a little academic. It may feel like, oh yeah, we've heard this before, but I'm going to toss in something that I'm pretty sure you never have. Because I really think there's one cause for all of our stress. Um, and once we understand what that is, we immediately are able to do something about it. But as long as we don't accept this as the cause, then we will always be struggling with our environment doing it to us. I remember there was, I was having this conversation with a lady in Canada. She was doing this podcast or something, and she said, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about stress? You know, we had we were having this long conversation, and at the end she said, what do you think is the biggest myth that people believe about stress? And I said, I think the biggest myth is that people think that stress happens to them like a virus or a bacteria where somebody sneezes and we inhale the, the pathogen and we get sick. And that's how stress happens, people think. Somebody does something and then we can't help it, we just automatically get stressed. If that's the case, then we're doomed because we will always be at the effect of environmental conditions most of which we can't control at all, correct? So let's kind of put that to the side and say, okay, well, if, that's, if it's not everything outside of me that's causing me stress, then what is? Right, and so let's, let's analyze how that happens. Because uh, I don't think you, every time I do this, and I do hundreds of these, People go, wait, they never said that in the Psych 101 class or the, uh, my high school health class. They never said this. So I want us to, for a second, imagine, just kind of picture, if we could, that we're transporting ourselves back in time a hundred generations. So I don't know what years those would be. BC sometimes, okay. And we're all suddenly living back then. Same group, wherever everyone else is. <laughs> and where is everyone else? All over the world. Okay. I don't even know where to look. <laughs> So we're all living, and let's pretend that we live in Ogden, great place. But it's, well, what's obviously not here a hundred generations ago? Pretty much everything that we play with now, right? There's no electricity, no anything, cars. But, so let's pretend for a sec that we live out in the wild. And I'm, I live over in a cave over on the east bench. It's a really nice cave. <laughs> and I've invited you over to my place for a picnic. We just killed some big something. Buffalo. Buffalo, yeah, that sounds like it. And it's sitting on the fire, and I brought my Fred Flintstone golf club. We're working on our short game. And we're just enjoying each other's company. You're at my place, and we're all living in the same neighborhood. And we're just having a good time. I mean, picture that. We're just enjoying each other's time. At some point, so I live, I live, my cave happens to be really near a forest. And you notice that there emerges from this forest this gigantic bear. He smells our buffalo, was it? Buffalo. And he wants some. And so he's running straight at the food, but it looks like he's running straight at you. Okay, so you're sitting there, you know, working on your cutting or whatever, and there's a bear running straight at you. What's the first thought you're going to have when you see this bear coming full blast towards you? What's your first thought? 
<laughs> what did you say? You said run? Like the fun of life, right? Okay. <laughs> or take my golf club and beat the tar out of it. Yes? Is there any other thoughts that you might have, first of all? Okay. We might, okay, so is there any other thought we might have? If you're not sure about yourself, somebody, probably protecting others around you. Okay, which is probably this. No. Correct? Yeah. Okay. These are all the second thoughts. And I heard it from somebody, was it you? Who said something before? Talk oh, crap, yeah. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thought. It's not this, it's this. Why do we have this thought? What is, what is behind this thought? When you said, I don't crap you. Well, what's behind that? Uh, Big Bear, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> because I'm scared. in danger, right? I'm scared that I might die. Okay? I'm dead. Um, I could die or have some pain, right? Which we don't like. Our body does not like physical pain, really doesn't like physical pain. That's the first thought. Now, let me ask you this. Is that a conscious thought? No. no. It's subconscious. Semi. Yeah. Why did you say semi? Because you, you, rec you make an assessment of what the bear is. The bear is a threat. I mean, if it was a cat, you know, a domestic cat comes right now, you're not going to be like that. Like, you make an assessment, and you're not going to be like, this is a threat. But at the assessment of that, you've already put it in your beliefs that that bear is bad. Correct. Correct. So you've had past experience with bears. So it was something that you before that I choose fuzzy thing, but you know that the bear equals correct. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever been, and it wasn't back then, hundred generations ago, but have you ever been near a bear and not been the least bit nervous? Where? At the zoo, right? No worries. The big bear, no big deal, right? I think it is a conscious thought. Albeit really fast. Like, Assess danger. Oh, and then here's the thing that happens. This is really interesting. After that, everything goes unconscious. It goes sub. It goes automatic. We call it the autonomic nervous system. And this takes over, and there's an enormous flood of activity. And this is what you did learn in in your junior high health class. There's a huge flood of activity that takes place. Immediately after this thought, is that my phone? Yeah. Um, so really quickly, and we won't spend any time, you've all heard this before, what happens immediately after you have this thought here that turns on this what we call the fight or flight response, but it's a physiology that every system in the body changes. So what are some of the things? You have an increase in adrenaline. What's adrenaline? Adrenaline. What is that? There's another hormone that's also involved. Cortisol is the other one, right? And every single cell in the body gets some. It's like cranked out from our adrenal glands and every immediately, okay, which caused a subsequent mm, change in physiology. What other things? The amygdala gets Okay, so we have a lot of brain senders that are giving, sending messages to the rest of the body. Okay, so um, I'm going to put just thinking changes, and we're going to explore that in a second. What else? What are the things? Like all the little man things? Like, because I know that your digestion, like all those are soft. So we have decrease in digestion, correct? Um, what else? What happens? Heart. What does the heart do? Yeah. Increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure. What happens to breathing? 
increases. increases and it becomes, does it, is it deep or shallow? So we have shallow breathing and it's fast, correct? Mm -hmm. What happens to the blood sugar? Mm -hmm. What? It increases, it spikes, yeah. So we have an increase in blood sugar. Where does that come from? That is glucose. Where does it come from if it's not there before the bear shows up? No, the adrenaline creates that to happen, but where is that blood sugar stored that now is suddenly in the blood? Not in fat, it's too slow. It's in the liver. Yeah, you've got tons of sugar just waiting in the liver for these kinds of situations. Okay, now, this is a really, really long list of things. There's also things that turn off. We have decrease in the immune system turns off. Can you think of any other systems of the body that stop working? Yeah, you change so that you change what you can feel in um, pain. Um, I've heard another, what was, what other systems of the body do you not need? I mean, on the far end of digestion. Demons, Don't need that. Yeah, all the plumbing, all the. <laughs> yes, yes. Do you need the reproductive system? No. Don't need reproduction. That's not going to help. <laughs> um, when you're. Okay, what about um, other. So these are the two primary hormones. What happens to all the other, the feel good hormones? What did you say? You went. Yeah, they they kind of go up on the table and they say, so our feel-good hormones, kind of the ones that keep us happy, they turn off. Um, okay, so it's a really long list of things that turn on and a really long list of things that turn off. All have one single purpose. Um, after we have this thought, we unconsciously... We automatically turn this on for one single reason. What is it? To survive. To survive what? Whatever event you're going through. Yeah, and for them, a hundred generations ago, it was a physical threat. And as far as anyone can tell, the, the people in the world who study stress Nobody can find another reason for the stress response than this right here. It doesn't have any other purpose but to keep us alive in moments when we are in physical danger. Okay, we good with that so far? Make sense? Now, this is another thing that they, I don't, I don't think they told you. Um, If we were to diagram this, again, let's go hang out in the academic world for a second. If we were to diagram this, this is how it would look. So we're in homeostasis, balance. We're hitting our golf balls, golf rocks. The bear shows up, and we call this, we call this up here, a threat thought. Okay, no, no surprises there. The crap, oh, whatever you said, <laughs> um, thought activates the stress response. So we go up into fight or flight. How long is that supposed to last? Now think about this accurately. Think about our ancestors. And they encountered the bear, how long did it take for them, probably maximum, to get away? Three minutes. You think? Three minutes. Yep. <laughs> how many would you get? You say? I'd probably look at the bear, say oh shit, and run. <laughs> like, run. That would be it. Three and seconds. You, and you'd run faster than normal. <laughs> yeah. By far faster yeah. than normal. 
Um, we used to do this thing when I was, I was growing up. It was really, really bad. <laughs> we all, I, I grew up in Pro and we, we all played baseball. We were all, you know, summertime baseball players. And during the winter, you couldn't play because there was just too much snow. And so we lived in this area that was just a little south of the hospital. And there was this home and there was this hedge. And there was a road and then the hospital and these cars would come driving by and we would just <laughs> hurl snowballs at the cars. I mean, I, I hate that I did this. <laughs> and I hate kids who do this now, but uh, the whole goal of our thing was to make the best dent sound. <laughs> uh, you knew you won, but we were just keeping our arms in shape for, for the season. So anyway, but even more enjoyable was when they would get out of their car and chase us. <laughs> and we knew our, our neighborhood, like the backs of our hands, we, the clothes lines, we knew where those were, we knew where the hedges were, we knew. Obstacles. Exactly. And, but we were super mad when we were running away from those guys because they were really ticked off at us. We thought, I mean, this was going on full blast for us. <laughs> Another quick story, kind of going to your thought of how long it would take. Um, I, I ride my bike a lot in the trails up here in, in North Ogden and the Ogden area. And I was riding one day and I came around. I'd been riding for about an hour and a half. And it, it was toward the end of the ride. And I had to go up one more hill. This was up in North Ogden. There was one more hill. And then I would make my way back home. And so I. I came around this corner and I suddenly heard this sound just underneath this bush that was right there. I, I didn't see it, but I do. Exactly, I see, you know, you live here, you can play. And I flew up that hill and it was like pretty steep, like five seconds. It was I exploded up. And I got to the top and I it was just wasted. Are we okay? Yeah. 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 Uh somebody might have listening I I went to the top of that hill in nothing flat. It only took like five seconds and I was out of maybe even the two or three and I was out of distance for the snake. It wasn't very long. So yes, I think you're right. The fight or flight, and what, as far as we can tell, it's nowhere more than about 15 to 30, maybe 60 seconds maximum, because that's how long it took our ancestors. And then at some point, we recognized we're safe. So when I got to the top of that hill, I was just, I, I couldn't even, I was like trying to get every breath of air. You know, when you're, when you're, I was completely out of breath, completely spent. So I, we go through this exhaustion phase. And after a little time of rest, we go back to homeostasis again. And that's how it's supposed to work. So this, this should actually be kind of same level. So pretend that's up there. 15 to 30 seconds is what it was designed to do. And if this were all we dealt with, no big deal. It wouldn't be an issue. Now, here's the thing that I do in my class, and I've done it with various groups. We don't have to do it in here, but I, I ask you this question. In the last week, two weeks, month, year, it's always the same answer. What amount of your life what percentage of your conscious days, because we don't count when you're asleep, what amount of your day were you in situations where that are the equivalent of a big bear, where you really were in physical danger? And I go around and I actually do this with my class. I ask every person, how much time in the last month did you spend where you were in legitimate physical danger? What do you think is the answer 
of a whole month, probably about that, right? Far less than 1%. You're exactly right. It's, you know, of the time that we are legitimately up here, legitimately in physical danger. Now, if that's accurate, which it is, and stress is only supposed to be turned on when we are in physical danger. Follow me? What? Why would we ever have stress? If we're not in physical danger, which is the only reason for the stress response. So what? Think through evolution, you know, going back to, you know, this situation that we just figured it out for ourselves over the last 3,000 years, our body has figured out a way to, uh, what do you call it, um, replicate the same exact response to situations that we deal with in the day to day. Work, you know, home life, things like that. Traffic jams. Yeah, exactly. Like everything that now is our brain sees them as the same thing, so our brain oftentimes is at a smaller scale re-triggering that entire cycle over and over and over again to the point that sometimes we get thrown into this like infinite loop and we don't know how to get out there or we don't know how to stop that cycle and as that builds up, it feels like it's getting longer and longer and longer to get out of it, so eventually we're so stressed out that yeah. that's going things like that. Let me see if I can word this, what you said in, in a way that, um, see, if, see if what I'm saying is parallel to what you're saying. Okay. Because okay? I like what you said. Did you have a thought too? Oh, I was just, just going to say uh, our relationship to a perceived threat, we assess it as a threat. So we start going through basically the relationship to whatever occurred. We, we assess that it goes into the threat pool, I guess, if you will. Yeah. This has a threat towards my livelihood, towards my ability, mm -hmm. towards my relationships, towards this or that. We throw it into that pool and then the body starts reacting because of that. Perfect. Let me, let me kind of sum up what I hear both of you saying. As I said, there's one cause for all of our stress. And, and I, I really think this is accurate and what you guys said <laughs> supports that. Anytime we say this for any reason, it doesn't make any difference if we're in danger or not. It doesn't make any difference. Our body is still thinking when we say, oh crap, I'm gonna be late, I'm in this traffic jam. You say this, you, you have the threat thought, the body goes, well, there must be a bear. <laughs> <laughs> that is what it's thinking, <laughs> because that's how our ancestors dealt with the danger is, that must be a bear, okay, stress response. Do you think our ancestors had that response to things that weren't like a direct threat to their livelihood, like, like we do today anyway, though, like if it didn't, Rain for like five days, and I guess that's like poor survival. But like they probably no. felt routine stress too. Like what what you said, they would put, actually put on weight when there was those kinds of environmental stressors. They would so which you know when when you say I tend to not be able to lose weight. There's there's all kinds of mm, how do I say this? Uh, hold on to that for just a second. Let's let's play with that um, next. So we have, anytime we have this thought, whatever it is, um, our body, see our body system, our immune system, our reproductive system, our nervous system, our form, they're not looking out here going, shut up, that's not fair. <laughs> they're not. They're just listening to our higher order thinking. Good um, Our higher order thinking, they're just listening to 
this what we say up here. And if it ever sounds like this or this, the only way we're designed to handle that, because that's how they did back then, was fight or flight. Now the difference, and what I heard both of you saying is, today we just keep saying, oh crap, oh crap, uh oh, oh crap, uh oh, oh crap, uh oh, oh my gosh, why, oh jeez, oh jeez. That loop that you were talking about. That's that's how I and sometimes it comes down, but it comes right back up. You know, we we go home and we watch a good movie, or we eat a nice dinner with somebody, and we're going, okay, are we getting a jacuzzi or having a massage or something? And then, but we next thing we know, right, right up here, right up here. Now, in the short term, no big deal, no big deal at all. As a matter of fact, we say. It's good to get yourself in this mode from time to time. Just like if you go and lift weights, to so show you, you go and lift weights, you're deliberately tearing down your muscles when you lift, right? You do these curls. And your muscles are actually tearing. <coughs> so that tonight when you sleep, they'll go, man, she does this again tomorrow. <laughs> I better be bigger. <laughs> right? Not true? And so it's the same with this. We get the more we, I think this is why we like um, <laughs> Six Flags and Disneyland and those kinds of things, or, or we thrill seek because there's safety in that. So there's that sense of, uh oh, but we still say, no, I'm still safe. We don't say, I'm going to die in those things most of the time, except if we do. <laughs> But when we say oh, deadline, oh, traffic jam, oh, I'm late, I've got to, what's the number one social fear in our country? What's the number one thing that more people are afraid of than anything else? And it's, and it's not dying, it's public speaking. Have you ever, ever seen somebody public speaking and get killed? <laughs> <laughs> The only one I ever saw, I don't know if any of you remember this, I'm a little older than most of us, but there, George Bush, the younger one, he was in the, far, the Middle East somewhere, and he was giving this um, speech, and yeah, the guy took off his shoe and hucked it at him. What did he do? He saw him, he went, <laughs> right? And then he went back to speak. That's the closest I've ever seen to somebody getting hurt. So why would anyone have this thought, I could have pain, I'm dead, for public speaking? <laughs> There's the perception that people are going to judge me a certain way, and our body goes, okay, blah, 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 people are going to hurt me. It doesn't recognize that there's no, it's not saying, because you're not saying, I'm safe when I go up there. You're saying, I'm going to get judged. And that, to our mind, is it's still a threat. Exactly. Yeah. Or anything else, and being late, or whatever it is. And our body just goes, okay, here we go again. There's another. And so what we do all day long is we keep putting our body systems out of balance. Every single system in the body, when it's in the stress response, is out of balance. And so we can't really say, well, it's going to result in this because every system, some people get high, some people get lupus, some people get fibromyalgia, heart disease. I mean, they said as much as 50% of the heart diseases we struggle with today are caused not by all the other things, but by stress, which is like 1,700 people that have died today from heart disease in America. It's a huge number. Half of those. This is playing a huge part. As a matter of fact, when I was writing the textbook, one of the things that we, we were looking at, all the different reasons, or all the different maladies of our culture, right? We couldn't find a single one. That stress does not make worse. And some of them directly cause, like headaches, almost one-to-one. -one. Not migraines, 
But, and there's other reasons for headaches as well, like you mentioned dehydration. But it's really close as stress goes up, headaches tend to. The one that I know for sure, there's been mountains of research on this, and this should be on all of our radar. As stress goes up, the immune system goes down. Do you get that? Now think about everything that the immune system is designed to prevent. I remember when I when I first started studying this, AIDS was a big deal. You know, and not that it's not anymore, but back when everyone was so worried in the, in the early 80s, mid 80s, everyone was so worried about and and when somebody would get it, become HIV positive, one of the first things doctors told them was don't stress, because they recognize that these guys no longer have an immune system. That's what's wrong with them is they have no longer so they get stressed and suddenly this Kaposi sarcoma cancer, which doesn't or pneumonia, that's what they would die from. But they tell them, do not let yourself because you're going to die. And they did. Okay. All right. So this is the cause. It has to be this because there's plenty of people who are in rush hour traffic or speak in front of people who don't have, the, who don't have any of this going on. They stay here. So if it's not the thing, then it has to be something inside of us, and if we can just go, okay, it's this. Then we can suddenly go, oh, can I do something about that? Okay, any questions to that point? About 20 minutes? Is that, we go until, whatever, top of the hour? Okay, any questions to that point? We good with that? Okay, so, if you are a smart person, no, I'm going to keep this here. If you are a smart person, just looking at this, what then is the solution to preventing stress? Because I do think stress is preventable. It's not easy, but I think it's preventable. Looking at this right here, everything we've done, what's the solution to Situation. Differently, yeah. Right. Changing your relationship to the threat, or what the stressor, the. Because I know for me, yeah. one that I ended up learning once was just like, you know, this is a challenge and I like challenges. Yeah. To remind myself, it was like, oh crap, I started going down that bad road. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is just a challenge and I like challenges. So it's like, instead of taking it from the threat of saying, like, oh no, I want to work toward the. Because yeah, I like challenges. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And we're gonna change your phone. We're gonna explain what you just did because it's really cool. Yeah, I was just gonna say cut out the the uh, from the threat thought. No threat thought, no stress. That's what we want to figure out is how do we do that? I mean show you how because I agree. No threat thought, no stress. I don't think there's an exception to that. And I've been working with this for 25 years at the university level of research and all that kind of stuff. I still can't find where that doesn't apply. My brother was a couple years ago, and I, I didn't understand the kind of like, you've got to lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> that and, might work for. And it, and it does do it. I mean, I'm, I'm learning how, how lower your expectations can. It's not, it's not that you don't have expectations of things, but there are certain things you can't have expectations. Good. Okay, so let's explore this. How do we do what you guys are, are saying? I think there are my hand. There are three questions that we can ask ourselves. There's a fourth, but we don't have time for the fourth. There are three questions that we can ask ourselves that if we ask answer them accurately, we absolutely prevent this from happening here. We prevent this from turning on. So and actually, it's here. We prevent this threat thought. The first question we can ask ourselves in any situation is, am I in danger? Or you could say, 
am I safe? It's the same, it's the same question. Now, this is not a conversation you're having with somebody else. This is a conversation you're having with your insides. Because remember, they can't see out here. They're just going, okay, whenever she says, I'm in danger, I know what to do, and I'm just waiting for it. And, and until that happens, I'm going to fix everything. I'm going to make your muscle bigger because you worked out. But as soon as you go into this mode, everything drops except for get the heck out of there or beat the tar out of somebody. Okay, so what's the right answer to this if we decide 99 points, whatever percent of the time? I am safe. <clears throat> now, it may not feel like, so like if you're, if, I'm just going to use a hypothetical, you're in rush hour traffic and you could lose your job if you come in late, or at school we always say you're in rush hour traffic and you might miss the test. But the question is, you're telling your body, am I going to die here? And that answer, 99% of the time is, most of our days feel like this. No, we're either, it, there's, there's no, we've made our lives so incredibly safe. And I'm not against that. I have no, no problem with that. You know, helmets, seat belts, and soft cushions. I, have, I don't know if you've heard of this. It was a surprise to me they have in cars now. You know how you have seat warmers? where you sit and your seat gets warmer in the winter and we're I'm okay with that. Now they have seat coolers. <laughs> you guys have this? Oh, you guys are like, oh yeah. <laughs> Is that what it feels like? Really? It's like, how comfortable do we, and I've heard, I haven't seen this, but now, not in the driver's side, but in the other ones, they have massage chairs in the car. <laughs> I'm all in with that. I think that's great. But we have we have designed our culture, designed our society, so safety is paramount. We're never in danger. And I'm okay with it. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm all in. But we have to tell our insides. Okay, this meeting I have, I am not going to die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we good with that? Now, the second question we can ask ourselves is, kind of sounds the same, can I handle this without dying? In other words, how do I know how, how do we know we're going to be able to survive this? What's one place we can look where, because the answer to this is yes, right? Most of all the time. So, how, but how do you know? How do you know that you can handle something without dying? You've seen other people do it. You've seen other people do it, or? You've, been you've done it before, you've been and mm -hmm. you didn't die. So. So you go, okay, I'm giving this speech, and, <laughs> what? <laughs> what if you almost died? <laughs> that is different. I mean, if you've been, I, I, the thought that came to my mind, you said that was cliff diving. Yeah. Right? right. Cliff diving, you go up 10 feet, no big deal. 20 feet, kind of bigger. 30 feet, it's kind of a big deal, and you deliberately don't do that because you almost did hurt yourself. So there are physical, still physical dangers that we can't dismiss out of hand and say, well, nothing's going to hurt us. Of course things will hurt us that we could potentially, but generally our days still most of the time feel like this, not going down a, you know, a cliff 30 miles an hour on my mountain bike, <clears throat> right? So I, I don't want to dismiss out of hand that nothing's dangerous. Of course things are dangerous, but you know what I mean. So we, we look at our at other people's past experience. Oh yeah, people speak in front of people all the time. And nobody ever gets hurt or dies. Okay, so maybe that could be the case. And again, you're talking to your insides. Okay guys, we're, we're okay with this. We're, we're going to be fine. 
Okay, the third question, and this, this is kind of what I heard you say, and slightly with the don't, what did you say? Uh, no, low expectations. Okay, sort of that, although I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you embrace that fully. Um, <laughs> Neither name tells us fully, but if there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you expect that someone's going to behave in a certain way, you can't control their behavior. Exactly. So there's certain exactly. ways that you can lower expectations. Yeah. Not. They mean water skiing. You know what I'm talking about? Water skiing, not yeah. light boarding, but water real. Yeah. You know, fall over. Really? <laughs> What's the worst thing that can happen? Not not the worst, but you're on a lake. What What's the worst? The thing that most Quickly ruins your day's water skiing. What? Choppy water, right? Can you do anything? Can you calm the waves? Do any of you know how? I don't know anyone. One person, maybe, that in all of humanity has ever been able to go, okay, wait. <laughs> so that's an example that comes to mind when you say that. Of, Lower my expectation. It's not going to be a glass day every time. As much as I want it to be that way. So the third question that we can ask ourselves, and we spend literally half a semester, my, my online class that I do for everyone else, probably two-thirds of this program is designed to help answer how to answer this question, and that is, can I think that's says think. Different. Think about this, what did you say? Different. Differently, yeah. Can I think about this differently? And I believe we have the ability to think anything we want to in any moment. There's not somebody in there going, okay, you've got to think this way. And if you don't, you're going to die. There's not, that person's not, we have, you know, the ability to make choices. And so in any situation, because you see it all the time, rush hour traffic, where people are just, next car over, this guy's just pounding his car. And then over here, the girl's just singing. <laughs> right? Same situation. One's having a myocardial infarction and the other one <laughs> finally able to, you know, look at the scenery on the way to the same place. So that tells me this is possible. I remember it many times I'll, people say, I just can't, I can't, I'm a hot head or I have red hair or I, I, I have road rage and I can't help it or I just, I'm too afraid to do this or that thing. And I remember there was one story, one, one incident that I, I just love this story, where it proved to me that this is completely within our control in any situation. And then the situation was um, my daughter, I, I had one daughter who was really, really uh, involved with sports, and she played soccer on this team that was kind of a traveling cop team. And, they had a game up in Mountain Green one day. Beautiful place, just an absolutely gorgeous area. And it was a typical Saturday where everybody, all, all of the, it was kind of a North Ogden neighborhood. I live up there, and there, it's kind of a neighborhood team. And so we knew all the parents really well. And they were just you and me kind of people, just normal, happy, functioning. So. Anyway, we got there, we had gone to, my other son was playing in some this basketball, I think. We, we got finished with that and we rushed to the top. And the soccer game started at 2 o'clock. Soccer match, I don't know. And we just flew in there and my daughter got out of the car and she started running over. But we recognized that the, it wasn't starting, the match wasn't starting. And we thought, well, that is weird. Soccer never starts late. They're really on time, and they do a good job of making sure that the games get in when they're scheduled to. At least that's been our experience. And so, uh, and so my wife and I and my younger son were walking over to the bleachers 
while the two teams were warming up, this team and her, my daughter's team was over here, and they kept warming up with us. We got over to where the bleachers were. What's going on? We sat down and we started. And all the parents were like, not all, well, most of them were like, started. We got things. There was some David Provo with Paul and some they were interested in going to. I don't know. I don't understand why. Um, anyway, the, there was other things going on. And they were like, get this going. <laughs> and we realized it was about 15 after, 10 or 15 after. And we recognized, oh, the guy in the middle, the center ref, what do you call the guy who gives him the card? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the, the, the head ref. Okay, that was. I don't know. I don't understand soccer. <laughs> if they would get rid of offside, then soccer would be great. <laughs> that was a layup for heaven's sake. <laughs> they don't kind of have layups. They never say. <laughs> no, I love soccer, and I love that my kids play that. It's understand. Anyway, so these parents, they're they're just getting. Angry and angry, and they recognize, oh, this guy's not here. And they started plotting against this guy. You know, they were like, I couldn't believe it. They're like, this guy's never going to rest in Utah again. Yeah. <laughs> we are going to call, because this guy was ruining their Saturday. And it was just like this firestorm was growing amongst them. you and me. It was like this group here, only in the stand. You guys in the stands, and they were just angrier and angrier. And I was, it was so intense that I actually got off the bleachers with my son, and we went, let's go sit over here. <laughs> really not. My wife said, you know, I shouldn't leave. I'm a friend. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it was quarter after, and Who's the, the flag guy, you know, the, the guy who calls the offside? <laughs> so the flag, oh, you know who I'm talking about. So what? A line rep. Line rep, okay. He's the one I wish they would get rid of. <laughs> no offense at all. Yeah, exactly. So he gets a phone call, and all the parents are like, we know who that is. We, we're going to, it's over for this time. I mean, he's, Ruined their name. And so he, he was talking to me, he says, Yes, yes, I'll tell him. I'll be sure to tell him. And, and so he walks over and he's facing the fans in the stand. And he said, That was the ref. And he's late because his son got in a horrible accident in North Ogden. They had to take him to Instacare up there and take care of those affairs. He said, He apologized. And he's going to try and get here as fast as he can, but he's really, really sorry he had to take care of his son. Now, what do you think happened immediately to everybody in the stands? Everything heard the whole mindset changed. Totally. Totally. They went from, this guy is killing us, to, man, I'll go out there and pull flags on him. I don't know what he wants. That would be fun to do stick a red card in front of somebody. I don't know what that means. You know, that, they were like, oh, don't tell them to not come. We'll play another day. No big deal. And I, as I was watching this go on, I kept thinking, when did we just think about... Nothing had changed. Nothing had changed about the situation. <clears throat> except how they interpreted it. And I thought, why didn't they just do that in the first place? You know what I mean? Why didn't you just think about the traffic jam or the or, or whatever it is? We have that power. Now, it is tricky because we're trained to just, somebody yells at you, you get it back. Mm -hmm. But we do have the power to think differently about things, ways that don't go this way. There's one way that works best of all that I found, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll take any point. There's one way that works every single time. I cannot think of a situation where I don't think it's possible to be thankful and stressed 
at the same time. I don't think it's possible to be grateful. Because whenever you think of something and are grateful about it, you have none of this going on at all. And I know that seems like, well, how could I be grateful for? Just look around and start saying, man, I'm grateful I have a car. I'm grateful I have a job. I'm grateful I have clothes to wear. I'm grateful. You can just go all day, all day, all day with this. And all the while, your body's going, okay, I must be safe. I must be safe. I must be safe. Good. Prevent it. That one thing alone, if that's all we did, there's all kinds of other things that we, we talk about in the class, but that one thing, if you just said, I'm grateful that I get to have this guy yelling at me, because that means I'm alive. I remember I had one student who, he had gone through two heart attacks, and the doctor said, you've got to do something about your stress. And said, what should I do? He said, he said, I don't know, but you've got to do something about your stress. And so he ended up in my class. He took my class three times. Um, because it was that important to him, because otherwise he was headed back to his. And so the, the doctor said, and so his motto every day was, a day above ground is a good day. And everything beyond that was deserved. A day above ground is a good day. And he would, he, he would always say that. He'd always say that to me, Mike, a day above ground is a good day. I <laughs> know. Yeah, but you have no idea how how important that is to me. Everything that happens now that I'm alive, I'm grateful for. And he would he would literally stay here all the time. Now, sometimes we forget and we need to turn it off somehow. Sometimes we forget. And that's when we do meditation and yoga and massage and all those kinds of things, humor and all the different things. But as far as prevention is concerned, one thing is, can I think about it without adding the stress on you won the stress war. Any questions? Well, I've enjoyed coming and playing with you guys. Um, it's my pleasure doing this. I love doing this. And I, I, I'm headed to St. George to do this again for a company that will, will spend all day. Um, this is just because people, as soon as they get this, they go, I can. I can do this. And it's it's really exciting to see us capture it. It's funny that you say like saying that you're grateful. Because that's something I do with my kids. Every time they start to get high to in the car, you know, I'm like, first things you're grateful for right now. You know, because you're stressing me out by being crazy to that piece, you know? And either my hand's gonna fly back there or you better start speaking up. And yeah. Even them, hearing them say what they're grateful for, calms me down. Does, you know, so I think that's really good. Powerful, powerful stuff. Yeah. It's not, that this is not a small deal. That's the other thing. Thankful stuff for just being grateful. If you stick kind of on the same line in terms of dealing with other humans, which we do all the time. Because I mean, like, gratitude is like, oh, I'm alive, or, you know, pretty something, stuff like that, or I have this, I have that. Yeah. But in terms of dealing with other people, um, compassion is kind of like along the same line. Yeah. Compassion for another human being kind of the same way. But, um, you know, on, maybe this is kind of part of this, but there was a point where, you know, everything is getting cut off in traffic. Sure, yeah. And there was a point where I was, I'd always get mad, and then I was like, what's, what changes with this? And I was like, maybe they're in a hurry because their kid got in a car accident, yeah. or their wife, or I'd be driving like that if I, if I found out, and it's like, please forgive me, I'm not a jerk. It's just that today I have to get there. And that's that whole right. assessment when, I, when it occurs, it's like, maybe that's happening. I can go two routes. I can go the one where I'm pissed. He's a jerk, ruins my whole day. Or I can go the route, you know what, maybe, you know, it's like a compassion. That maybe their kids yeah. are wrecked and they got to get to the hospital. And it's just like, yeah. it's fine. I'd be driving like that, too, if, if I was in the same boat. I have this kind of along the same line. I have this belief that everybody who flies by at 95 miles an hour when I'm only going 85 and wishing I were going <laughs> but, or 120 or whatever, my thought is, his wife's in the back and she's going to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't get to the hospital. 
They're all over it. But the thing is, I'd rather be beautiful. I'd rather be peaceful. Is it worth that basically is, is, is what you can ask for? Yeah. You can see yeah. where else you're going yeah. to go. Sure. It's almost even like selfishly, it's like, yeah. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to feel upset. Yeah. I don't have to. Exactly. Yeah. Let go. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I um, say thank you for driving fast so that the police officers on the bike can you. Exactly. It's like, oh, this is. That's, See, there's so much flexibility in this. There's so much there's so much we can do with it. It's really, really the, as good a solution as anything I have ever found for preventing stress. So it's my pleasure playing with you guys. Thank you for letting me come and